Hello, everyone. Seven Investing CEO Simon Erickson here, and thank you for listening to the Seven Investing Podcast. Our podcast is made possible by our subscribers, who allow us to empower you to invest in your future each and every month. In exchange, we give our subscribers exclusive access to our monthly stock market recommendations from each of our lead advisors. To support this podcast and join other Seven Investing fans in our exclusive subscribers forum, where we discuss the latest market moves in real time, go to 7investing.com slash subscribe to subscribe to 7investing today. We're here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7investing. Hi, and welcome to the latest episode of No Limits with Christoph and Luke, a 7investing podcast production. This is episode 21. Today is a Friday, 7th of July, and you're the man traveling this month. What's happening, Christoph? Buongiorno, Luca. <laughs> <laughs> I realized Beautiful. for prepping for this episode, Luke, that this might not be an investing podcast. This might be more of a travel and uh, see the world podcast. You've been doing the heavy lifting, of course, going to... India, Sri Lanka, the motorcycling, biking across the Balkans, correct? The Balkans, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the least I could do is get myself to a far-flung island at least once a year. For real? So, You're an American who travels. You do have, you've proven you have a passport. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I need to update my Polish passport, and it's, it's occurred to me. But yes, yeah, so you are meeting me on the fascinating island of Sicily, which is in the autonomous region from Italy, if you mm. I don't know if you knew that. You can't see much Sicily uh, in your background, but what's out that window? So outside this window is actually a blazing hot sun, which is why the, the shades are closed. But right behind that are those old terracotta shingles. But you have to believe me that there's the old town terracotta shingles and behind that a, a very high bridge that connects one side of the valley to the other because Modica, where I'm at, is a small old town that, that suffered a giant earthquake back in 1693 uh, and has uh, a high part and a low part in this really tall bridge where you could see cars going over. That's behind the window. Okay. And you there visiting friends and family or what's, what's the trip? This is my beloved wife's home. Cool. Uh, she's uh, of Sicilian heritage, and she wanted a getaway, a getaway from the crazy Americans' house. Very good. Nice. So this is where I'm. Where I'm at. Very good. How's and you're uh, you're there for a couple of weeks. Almost the full month of July, Luke. Fantastic. Fantastic. The uh, yeah. I suppose it's uh, it's it's like summer holidays at the university, is it? Uh, yes. Correct. There's an. Very good. Yeah. I knew you educators didn't really do any work. <laughs> right. We are, we are uh, people of leisure. I hope you've got a suitcase full of papers to grade. I leave that to the chat GPT now. Just <laughs> handle these for me, will you? <laughs> How are the uh, cool and stormy climbs of, uh, of Great Britain? Uh, beautiful, beautiful, sunny day today. Actually, one of the hottest days of the year so far. I've just been playing tennis this morning, sweating my ass off. And, uh, yeah, nice, nice day out. But it's, it's Wimbledon season right now as well. And so a couple of very exciting matches in the last couple of days. And I'm, Katrina and I are going tomorrow. We've got center court tickets. So hoping to see, uh, either Murray or Sissipas play, depending whoever wins today. Oh, that is so stunning. I have, I've always wondered what the grass looks like. I'm a tennis aficionado myself and I've gone to the U S open quite a few times, but never made it to the fair grounds of, of, uh, what strawberry and whipped cream. Is that the, yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Is That's that right? Yeah. Strawberry and whipped yeah. cream. Well, but, uh, oh, our, uh, our, our Wimbledon's mostly champagne and pims. That's probably the more important thing to oh. imbibe. Yep. Yeah. And also, uh, I'm a Nadal man, have been since, you know, the, the teenage years. So tennis mm. season is kind of a little bit, uh, feeling unfulfilling at the moment, knowing that sure. it's kind of my run has been over. It's getting close to the end. Right. Do you okay. think he has one more yeah. in him? You it's, think he has one more championship in him? Uh, 
Yeah, let's hope so. Like he's come through some injury, right? So it's whether he can kind of get back to like world class level and uh, and be competitive with like Djokovic. I guess he's the he's the favorite these days. Yeah, stunning. It is stunning what he's doing. I thought to ask you that since we have been traveling quite a bunch, you specifically to go back to your trips to India and Sri Lanka, are there, and we've talked about the big picture landscape that we consider India the next big economy for the what? Yeah. It's setting itself up for the next decade and two. Do you have any other investing insights from your time in India? I do. I had a really interesting couple of days in Hyderabad um, and actually hanging out with some uh, major industrialists, I guess. Uh, one of my very close buddies um, has gone from kind of founding his own tech company, uh, selling it for a large amount of money. He was the first man in Hyderabad to have a uh, Lamborghini, which we had a, ch a chance to ride in while we were there. Very cool. Uh, and now he's branching out into all sorts of super interesting businesses. Uh, um, you know, it, an airline, um, uh, like logistics, like bicycles and uh, that kind of, you know, getting around town, green transport. Uh, but he's also about to launch, uh, I think, India's first um a televised poker league like an online televised poker so it's pretty exciting i had i had no idea actually Surprised poker was even a thing in india poker league yeah no. league so you can't they won't just let they won't let in any any old riffraff i think uh i think poker on or that sort of gambling is illegal i don't know so i don't actually know the, the deep background and um, we got to this part of the conversation when we were like 10 cocktails deep but um uh, I think it's not legal to play, say, cash game poker. So I think uh, I think they've devised a workaround involving kind of tournaments and prizes and things. I think I think that's what he's got in mind. But still, super exciting. I think that's quite early. But um, you know, more broadly in India, chatting to uh, him and some of his close friends at, at a house party just seems like a really fascinating place to be an investor. Like it's a shame. As uh, non-Indian citizens, we can't invest directly in India. But if you're there, gosh, there's some really exciting uh, opportunities. Apparently, the country has something like over 70, I think 72 unicorns now. That's like, you know, uh, companies valued at a billion dollars or more. That's massive. Working in tech, essentially, you're earning like a US tech salary. That's pretty common in India. So, my God, you're like you're living like a Maharaja with that kind of money um, in uh, you know, in that economic environment. So, uh, it, you know, incredibly strong startup ecosystem, but also incredibly rewarding for not just founders, but for, you know, deep, smart tech uh, workers in that industry, of which there are many, like it's a highly educated country. Um, and then another, another little interesting factoid, which perhaps built on uh, one of the interesting bits of the conversation we had with Krishna a few weeks ago. Uh, so one of my friends, his wife, Ishita, is a uh, the head of medical research at one of the larger hospitals in Hyderabad. And so there's, there's, a, there's a region there that's kind of colloquially known as Genome Valley. Essentially, there's so much investment in biotech and medtech uh, happening there. So really fascinating stuff. Oh, and then one other little uh, sort of factoid I'll share as well. So everyone was actually very proud of um, kind of how advanced logistics and services and things like that are in India and really literally puts the rest of the world to shame. So it seems you can order on your a phone on your app, you can make like a grocery request, delivery request, and like groceries are with you within 10 minutes. That's so highly scaled and uh, so responsive to um, to customer needs. So, man, you know, Amazon doing a brilliant job of doing like same day shipping in the continental US. India have got that nailed uh, 10 minute shipping in some of the bigger cities. Well, maybe that's a good place to frame the location a little more, more, more accurately, right? Because my stereotypical image of India not having been there is um, one of maybe because it's so big and now the most populous country that it's a place of many kinds of places, some of which are still, I imagine, highly chaotic or underdeveloped. Yeah. 
Yep. And so to generalize about India is kind of like generalizing about the United States, like which India, which, right, which state, which part of the country are we talking about? I hear you saying that the places that have the entrepreneurial lead are as good as any in the world. Other places obviously yep. are not even on the map. I, I guess like there's a huge kind of rural population across the whole country. But, um, you know, this is now the world's largest country, 1.4 billion people, um, uh, you know, and, and with some of the densest, most densely populated cities in the world, places like Mumbai and Delhi and Bangalore, um, you know, there's just incredible innovation coming out of those cities. You know, you put, put like super cheap, super fast internet, uh, together with like cheap and widely accessible technology and a really strong kind of education framework and a real entrepreneurial mindset kind of magic seems to be happening. Yeah. And you throw in the little bit of the magic AI juju juice in the rate at which all this will probably evolve is beyond anything we've seen. Yeah, I think so. I agree. And you know what, as far as investing in India, I just want to reiterate this one point, not having done due diligence beyond our conversation, I did buy one of those India type ETFs. Uh, I, I kind of, I, I didn't pick it at random exactly, but mind you, this is not, this is not, <laughs> this is not based on, on a lot of work on my end. It's I N D Y is the ticker and it com it's comprised of financial services, technologies, industrials, and it's, yeah, it's an India ETF. I pick um, up a nice 4% since, uh, since our conversation. So yes, right. you can invest in India, um, one by one, but you do any listeners of ours do have access to India in general via these ETF vehicles. Good stuff. Well done for putting your money where your mouth is. Excellent. So how does, uh, how does Sicily and Italy compare, do you think? Well, that's a fascinating question. So Luke, uh, you know, me, I like to do a little book learning. I just finished reading this. It's called the invention of Sicily and Mediterranean history. And I knew Sicily was, a. have been here several times before I, I knew it was a mysterious enchanted island, but I did not know the, obviously reading a book about a place's history will reveal lots, but I did not know the extent to which it is, oh, I don't know how to even phrase it. It's own thing. It's uh, autonomous from Italy, but it's, it has Arabic roots, nomadic roots, obviously Italian influence, Greek, Roman, African, Muslim, Jewish. It's this, it's this melting pot. When you add into that mix. Uh, the, due to all kinds of reasons, the, the organized crime, uh, yeah. faction, I guess, Cosa Nostra is, uh, deeply embedded into the culture. And that's been a fight, uh, for a century, over a century and, uh, and a quarter. Yep. It's one of these places where, uh, there is so much potential for everything you could dream of and it's and so there's people who are optimistic and working incredibly hard and trying to flourish despite all kinds of setbacks that keep happening over and over and over again which i guess is to be expected when one of the root layers in the culture is one of corruption and you'll find this i guess in any developed place if the if the government or 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 the people in who are in charge of things put themselves first, the whole civic landscape cannot possibly flourish because investors in the end are terrified to put any money, any real money in because who knows what will happen to it. Right? So, uh, it's, and yet it's more, it's looking more optimistic and hopeful than I think it has in a long time. I wanted to, uh, if for, for any fans of, of anything, uh, bookish who follow this podcast, there's a fantastic series about a detective called, uh, detective Montalbano. Have you heard of this series, Luke? No. 
They're kind of like murder mysteries. And what's great about them is that they capture the real essence of Sicily because the, the author makes the main character is you could, you could describe him as salty <laughs> and in, in his run-ins with the law and with criminals, he really describes Sicilian culture with an uninhibited critical eye. I thought I would read the first sentence to you, the way this, this second book in the series starts, the terracotta dog. Uh, because I thought okay. it was so apt to, as a description for us investors, to judge from the entrance that Don was making, it promised to be a very iffy day. That is blasts of angry sunlight one minute, pits of freezing rain the next, all of it seasoned with sudden gusts of wind. One of those days when someone who is sensitive to abrupt shifts in weather and suffers them in his blood and brain is likely to change opinion and direction continuously, like those sheets of tin cut in the shape of banners and roosters that spin every which way on rooftops with each new puff of wind. Inspector Salvo Montalbano had always belonged to this unhappy category of humanity. So uh, I don't see I don't see there being too many uh, investment opportunities in Sicily the way we think of the way we talk about them, like there is in India. But I thought that's such a nice, uh, nice metaphor for the stock market in general, uh, at least the way I experience it. Sunshine one minute, hurricanes the next. Uh, who the hell knows what you're going to get? And it's your disposition that matters the way you, you navigate all of it, right? Which is one of the, one of the main points you wrote about in your, in your, how can I describe it? Um, uh, magnum opus, uh, <laughs> your, your Twitter, your Twitter magnum opus. It was wonderful. It was so great. It, it got like what? Half a million views or is that right? Yeah. And still, uh, yeah, still going. Yeah. I did a, yeah, it looks, it does seem like it's still going. Uh, I, yeah, I kind of, my holiday project turned into a bit of a month long behemoth and I do that. Actually, I do this every couple of years, but it's the first time I've done it so transparently out in the open. I just went back through, looked at all of my major trades of the last 19 years and tried to learn some lessons basically for the next 19. So pretty cool. And, uh, seems like it resonated with a bunch of folk. I've had some really interesting conversations since then. Yeah. So do you mind if I poke, poke at you with, uh, some of no. these, uh, things that came my way via, via our, uh, <laughs> we're like, you know, you, like in, uh, what tweedle dumb and tweedle dumber, you, you know, whatever you <laughs> I have to suffer for. <laughs> Uh, well, let me start with, with something I wanted to, to just get you to riff on before I get to, to some, some feedback in the summary post you wrote about managing yourself yeah. as a key component to your success. That's obviously invisible. The numbers don't show that. And right. you know, I love harping on this stuff. This is kind of my own, I guess, bread and butter. You. You pointed out, if I may, you, if I may read these back to you, you wrote, avoid emotional investing, respond rather than react to market events, be humble, collaborate with others, accept that there is an element of luck. You won't get it right. Don't lose sleep. Right. And I kind of, I'm reading that and I'm nodding along. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then I think, oh yeah, that's easy to say, but how do you actually do it? And, right. and I guess that's one of these, you know, I don't know if it's a fault, but anyone scrolling through Twitter comes across that, you know, like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. And yet I know that this is, this is, this is essential. Can you, can you offer a little bit of maybe the process behind how you get to non-emotional investing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And, um, I suppose I'm going to expand it a little bit and then we'll come back onto that point. So, cause I, this is kind of, a, a mindset or an approach framework to investing that actually my buddy and Albert and I came up with a couple of years ago. So thanks Albert. I've plagiarized your information and it's got me half a million views on Twitter. Awesome. Um, <laughs> <Not you, Albert. laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, we thought like there's le levels to this stuff. And so there's like 
the bit you pulled on there is manage yourself, you know, manage your emotions and your thinking. Then the next level or the next thing is manage your actual portfolio, like the stuff you've bought and then manage the stocks in your portfolio. Um, so there's kind of three different types of activity and there's a whole bunch of kind of mechanical things you do when you do each of those things. But together, that's we think is kind of the whole story. Um, and the weird thing is, I would never have guessed this 19 years ago. I thought it was all about like stock picking um, and holding for a long time. The weird thing is of those three kind of disciplines, it's like managing yourself, managing your portfolio and managing your stocks. The most important by far, almost to the exclusion of the other two is managing yourself. Uh, it's much more important than uh, the companies you actually buy in some ways, because um, uh, because it's it's all about conquering your natural human instincts, either your greed and you're chasing something that you think is, you know, NVIDIA at, the, at its absolute peak, or it's about your FOMO and kind of buying into something at the wrong time on going like going too hard into a stock because you're like, I don't want to miss out on this thing. If you can, if you can be in charge of your emotions and that phrase I used respond rather than reacting to market events, like have a plan, never do anything quickly. If something happens like top, take a breath, count to 10, decide what the appropriate response is, which most of the time is do nothing. Um, if you can just kind of get those things right, then the rest of it kind of falls into place. Uh, everything else becomes 10 times easier because uh, you could buy the best companies in the world. But if you misplay those positions, uh, then you could still end up losing a lot of money or, uh, you know, perhaps wiping yourself out when you've done, you know, made a hundred brilliant decisions and you make that hundred and first disastrous one that could potentially could wipe you out if you've you know, you've got a bit big for your boots and suddenly you're doing crazy things with options or you're just wildly overexposed to like a single event, which it may, however so unlikely, might come to pass. Yeah, it's like a poker player going on tilt. Precisely, yep. Uh, amazing how quickly the tragic thing could happen. <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't harp on this very much, but as, some, uh, as someone who is, I hate to phrase it this way, in the business of Zen, I've, I personally have devoted a significant part of my time meditating as a way of life, which I would say, even though it's not the spiritual approach, uh, you don't want to meditate in order to get something, but for an investment context, I would say that the act and practice of meditating is one way of learning how to, uh, instill in yourself the capacity to watch what your own emotional emotions are rather than respond from them. So for anybody that is listening to this and wants a little bit of that, you know, hot tip, practical tip, put in asterisks next to meditation as a way to get something, cause that's problematic in many ways, but in this particular way, you could do worse than sit down for, I would. I would suggest 10 minutes a day and do absolutely nothing in those 10 minutes besides watch what your mind does. And then it gets easier when some bad thing happens in the stock market, which it will over and over and over again. And you have this hot flash of, let's say panic or fear or greed, it goes either way. And over time you can more easily notice that this is happening and without immediately jumping on your platform and making a dumbass trade. Yeah, it's good. I like it. I, I don't do that, uh, as, as often as I should, I, I practice yoga, do that occasionally. I should probably do a bit more and there's an element of, uh, you know, meditation at the end of the class, but I should definitely try and put aside more time for that sort of thing. It's, uh, that stillness is quite powerful. And it's also, you know, a know yourself kind of thing too. You are seasoned, you've been doing this for a long time, and it seems like you have a pretty good grasp on yourself. Therefore, this kind of embodied practice might not be, I would say, as essential for you. You're kind of polishing edges, right? But for beginners sure. or for people who are more excitable, 
And we know plenty of people who have been investing for a long time who nonetheless uh, invest from a place of reactivity. For them, I would put this kind of meditative practice high on their agenda of to do to become better. Just so interesting, isn't it, that the these mental and emotional capabilities are so important, as well as the technical capabilities and the you know the ability to identify a high quality company. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you said. In hindsight, I haven't done this this uh, rare rare view project like you have, but I know from my experience, which started in 1997, uh, had I not made the behavioral mistakes. I too could be, uh, retired now off on, on, uh, <laughs> uh, traveling the world, uh, more frequently than once a year. So, uh, I'm a hundred percent on, uh, on your side. I think it's true. You also, you also wrote Luke, be humble, collaborate with others and be transparent in your thinking. I see you doing this time and time again. And I think what I'm noticing more and more online on Twitter specifically is people being critical or abrasive to the idea of paying money in order to participate in a community like the one we have at seven investing. And I think this point that you made is a key rebuttal to that critique community is made of individuals and you need in order for the community to thrive and be legit it can't have trolls or it can't have actors they're acting in bad faith having some kind of call it paywall to me one of the functions it serves is to make sure that that people willing to pay to join the community are there in a sense self-selectively right they're saying, I'm giving you money because I see value in what you're doing. And therefore I'm going to treat it with a kind of civic respect, which is then creates a positive feedback loop, right? As opposed to what I see on Twitter, the individual gunslingers, that feels to me more like people involved in the hype cycle yelling bye 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 when times are good disappearing off the face of, of the earth when times are bad and never to be seen or heard from again right? right so when you wrote collaborate with others and be transparent in your thinking this is i think the main value of what our community at seven investing provides what do you think of all that yeah totally agree the the power of having constructive conversations with others, ideally people who have a different viewpoint, because it takes different viewpoints to make a market. Um, that's incredibly valuable. And if you're a troll or if you're just sort of closed to a constructive conversation, I mean, okay, you might be annoying everybody else, but the person you're really hurting is yourself. It's a, it's a, you know, a great tragedy. If you close yourself off from other people's views, you're not going to hear the bear case. Um, and you're not going to as fully understand that potential investment as you might. So getting in a community of different opinions is just incredibly valuable. And it's really in the, only in the last few months, but you know, I've really started to see that take off on the seven investing discord. And now we've got, you know, not enough. I wish there were more. It's like, you know, a thousand members in there. I wish more of those members were active and had a voice, but we've got a good, you know, cohort of folk now who are contributing their own views daily. And it's me helping me understand the investments I'm recommending much more thoroughly. Um, or that, you know, or just asking tough questions, which makes me examine my own thinking. That's good for me. And it's good for our members too. Yeah. Right. In the spirit of co collaboration, it's what I said before. Maybe I don't need to repeat myself. I find collaboration rare on Twitter, authentic collaboration, though there are exceptions. Whereas once you, you join a community like ours, it seems like the incentive to collaborate is much higher. And so people are predominantly putting forth arguments and rebuttals, but in the hope of making everybody better, as opposed to just being destructive 
which you see yeah. all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And you know, this the humble aspect is important as well. Um, like this came to bite me because I thought I was like the world's smartest guy at, at the kind of end of 2020. And, um, you know, I got humbled by what happened in 2022. Um, so it's just a great reminder, like however smart you think you are, uh, like the market's still going to turn around and bite your ass at some point. And you got to realize that, uh, you don't know it all. So, so in collaborating with others and being transparent, you, you know, from a position of humility, I think that's the right way to, to navigate that and, and sort of deport yourself when you're having these conversations. Right. And we went together and we suffered together, which I also argue yeah. is no small thing. It makes a big difference to know others are in the same boat to whatever degree, but you know, so, uh, so I received a message from an investor that I consider to be sophisticated and he's not a troll. He saw your, your portfolio numbers and didn't believe them just right <laughs> out. <told me. laughs> <laughs> said, uh, this, uh, in fact, let me do it. I think he, he used some, um, uh, some statistical term, uh, that, uh, it was like a six, six, uh, <laughs> six Sigma event or something like that. Meaning I think predominantly that the odds of the, your returns being so consistent over such a long duration of time makes it highly unlikely that the numbers are real. And so I, of course, had to put on my Zorro mask and, uh, <laughs> get my, get my steely sword, sharpen my sword, you know, and defend your honor. But I, I know just in, you know, I'm, I'm in this case, a middleman between two people that I find, uh, sincere and honest. And one is saying the other, it's too good to be true. <laughs> how do you, how do you respond to that like a credible like sure yeah yeah i think i, th I think no, maybe maybe the guy has misread my numbers because i'm anything but consistent i'm all over the place so you know 2020 a 90 percent return 2021 a five percent return 2022 a 36 percent loss uh you know if i go back to my early days 2006 i lost 10 percent 2007, I made 95%. 2008, I lost 11%. I'm all over the shop. So I record something called a sharp ratio. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to do justice to what sharp is, but essentially it's a measure of kind of volatility and your consistency. And like you want a higher sharp because then you can sort of rely on your returns. Like my returns are highly unreliable. My sharp ratio is 0.63. Um, so maybe your guy was reading my CAGA column because that's CAGA is my, is the compounded return over a period. So that, that obviously by definition is going to look super consistent because it's year after year after year. Yeah, it could, it could be, but, uh, I mean, he's, uh, very savvy with numbers. So sure. I, I don't, I mean, I mentioned that I would ask you specifically, uh, Maybe I guess that's what he he was referring to, but uh, just... okay. Let's let's assume you let's assume, assume you read the numbers right. Like I've, obviously I don't. Uh, but how how to frame this? I was about to say I've got nothing to gain by kind of lying. Obviously I have. I can build a Twitter presence by telling pork pies and pretending to be smart than I really am. I mean, at some point, other than me paying to get my results audited, which I'm. I just can't afford yeah. to do, and there's kind of no point, no utility to me in doing that. Uh, I can't prove it. But I've shared, you know, if you were to go through my 20 post Twitter history and kind of reassemble my trades, like the numbers would make sense because, you know, they're the real numbers that I've actually built the, was the, uh, conclusion from kind of it is what it is. If you don't want to believe me, that's totally fine. I have been incredibly okay. lucky. Oh, that's how, that's the end of that phrase. The, uh, which is another point of your roll up, you know, in complex systems luck does play a, uh, a feature and anyone who argues otherwise is deluding themselves. Yeah. But of course, luck over a 19 year period is a whole, you know, luck favors the, the prepared or something like that. Right. Yeah. 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 Some Let me give an example, a recent example of luck that hasn't 
materialized in my numbers, but will in the next five years. And then your guy will come back and criticize me again and say, this is impossible. But here's a, here's like a, here's the truth of how I navigated, um, the last two or three years. Um, like I retired from my job at the end of 2021. And I think my cash and my cash allocation in my portfolio at that point, I, I don't know for sure, like sort of 10%, it was like relatively low. And I thought, portfolio is on a massive high here. I'm in a great place. Like I'm really set up for retirement. I should just be smart, take some money out of play. And I sold it. So I, I went through my portfolio and I trimmed and sold some of my, some of the most expensive companies on a sort of price sales basis, very other, various other financial ratios, you know, companies that felt the most overvalued. And I, I, I built my cash up to about 25%, I think like a reasonably significant sum of dollars because my intention was to build an income portfolio with that money, buy a bunch of dividend paying stocks, and I'll have this income category. And that would inure me from like the swings of the market. And then before I could even buy my income stocks, boom, 2022 happened, the value of my portfolio got wiped out, my 25% cash allocation kind of grew to th over 30%, because basically everything else collapsed, but the cash stayed steady. Um, so in retrospect, like I could point to that and go, wow, what a genius was I selling at the absolute peak, almost within like days of the peak, like I'm a super genius. BS, that's not the case. I got lucky because I retired and I'm like, oh, I need some cash. Uh, so I freed up some cash and it turned out to be just the most incredible timing. And then I've put that cash back into play very steadily throughout 2022, 2023. Um, and so I, we haven't seen the benefit of that, of buying, you know, selling high and essentially buying lowish as we've, as I've been picking up some of these fantastic companies at lower valuations. I fully expect to see the benefit of that, of that over the next five or six years as this next cycle plays out. And those investments I made in the last year and a half are going to be some of the greatest investments I've ever made in my life. Um, so, you know, I will hopefully I'll be transparent and look back at that in five years time and say, hey, look at that luck of picking that perfect time to retire and, and making that play. But, you know, was I a genius? I could play it that way. I'm not trying to say that, though. I'm just being honest with myself. Well, you are a little bit of a genius. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. I hope, I hope people listening to this take it, take it to heart. Fortunes are made, uh, slowly and then all of a sudden. Cool. Thanks for, thanks for giving me a chance to, to chat about it and, uh, defend my position to your buddy. You'll have to put yeah. me in touch. I'd, I'd like to understand his, uh, his critique in a bit more detail. Maybe there is some learning for me there. My sense is I think he might have misread. It's what you pointed out. He might have misread the, the compound annual growth rate for the volatility, though. Yeah. I'll double check. I'll get back. Let's, let's let the drama unfold. I'll get back to you. <laughs> I'll get back to you ne next week. Cool. So you also have been playing around with uh, increasing your own cybersecurity. <laughs> yes. It's one of my principles, right? Be a customer of the companies you invest in. And I realized one of my highest conviction companies was CrowdStrike, the endpoint security, cybersecurity leader. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest positions in my portfolio and perhaps, you know, certainly one of, if not the highest conviction company I own. And I'm like, I've never actually used this software. I should get my hands dirty. So yeah, I got, uh, the guys at CrowdStrike to give me a one week frat Falcon trial and, uh, install that on my home PC. I've never felt safer. <laughs> 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 how, uh, uh, how simple was the setup and like, like superb, like dead easy. Uh, just like literally it's just like installing any commercial pieces, like easy piece of software off the web, download it, install it sets itself up silently. I've not noticed any kind of performance impacts or anything. Um, it tells me it's protecting me. I did go out of my way to try and do nefarious things on my PC and uh -huh. remotely to my PC. And I haven't actually, I haven't got it to trigger and do anything yet, but I, and I was trying to go down a rabbit hole and understand why I'm like, I'm, I'm sure this stuff actually does work. It's, it must work, right? All I'm <laughs> testing here is, all I'm the testing is the fact that, like, how easy is it, where, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it turns out, I think it's smart enough to know 
that, you know, I was there with an admin login doing kind of things that an admin might do, like deleting my event log and stuff like that. So I think it's smart enough to know that, like, it doesn't need to tell me about that because it knows that's me doing that thing. I don't right. have to There's try and be really yeah, sort of... Uh, having had uh, one too many yeah. on a uh, Friday yeah, yeah, night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So my trial is sadly is going to expire in the next day or so, and I haven't actually had a cybersecurity event to see see what happens. But uh, I'm going well, to take you, you... on trust. That's the stuff that actually works as a platform. The bit I wanted to do was just kind of install it, play with it, see what reports I could get out of it. And uh, like I've, I've been impressed with that. It's very, very easy for what is an incredibly complicated, sophisticated piece of software. They've made it very easy for a layman. And that was important for me because... The company's trying to go down market now because they've already got like all the big enterprise companies, like 15 of the top 20 banks in the world, huge percentage of the Fortune 500 as customers. But they're now trying to move down market and get more into the sort of SMB market. Um, and so I felt, I felt, you know, is it, is it easy enough just for like a mom and pop company to install this thing and use it? And I think yeah, my conclusion is yes, it absolutely is. Are you going to renew? Uh, no, because I just, I mean, I'm, I'm just one guy with like a PC and I just don't need it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's cheap. It's like a couple of hundred dollars a year, but that's a couple of hundred dollars I could be spending on, uh, you know, tools that I actually probably do use. And, you know, the reality is Microsoft Defender is kind of good enough for like a home PC. I don't do any crazy ass stuff on my PC, really. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for doing, getting your hands dirty. It's, uh, it's men like you who, who make us honest investors. Anything? You got anything in your portfolio that you're hankering to be a customer for? Hmm. You know, right now, uh, I'm torn about SoFi. Oh, yeah. Because I, I made that into a sizable position when it fell to what I thought was ridiculous levels. And on the strength of uh, our colleagues' repeated deep dives, I learned quite a lot about it. And at a certain point, uh, I kind of, I kind of nailed the bottom on this one. I invested a, a huge slug and I'm very happy with the results. And so I had an account from a few years back and I wasn't all too, I wasn't a huge fan of, of the interface. It kind of seemed busy to me, like just a lot of stuff, loans. And, and I mean, I don't know for, for users of SoFi, I think, you know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like, uh, just felt all over the place, but. Its rates at the moment are the, some of the most competitive. I do love that you could, in fact, have all of your financial dealings all in one spot. It's just now that last bit of, do I really want to redirect my direct deposits and all my billing, regular billing stuff? You know, like that'll, it's kind of like, it's stupid in a way, but, uh, how long would this take me? It would take me probably two hours on some afternoon to redirect all the bills and stuff. Is it worth it? Probably, I guess, Wells Fargo isn't paying me bupkis to mm -hmm. keep my money there. Plus, I don't like their, you know, the, the um, what's it called? The scandals of the past. Yep. So what's stopping me from moving over to so SoFi? Nothing really. That's probably my next move. Cool. Great. That's good. And you, um, so from your initial views though, are you, are you happy with it as an investment based on the kind of feel of the, the, the service to a customer? As an investment, I'm happy because it done gone up a lot. <laughs> uh, in stock went down further. Hell no, I'm not moving my money. No, I, uh, but. Yeah, the platform, I'm warming up to the platform. But right. so it's just getting over that, 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 that last mile that I was just ranting on about. Should we talk about, uh, threads first Twitter? Yeah. Let's do that. Are you on threads yet? I, I can't you because it told me that, that Italy is not regionally available or maybe not Italy, maybe Sicily is its own thing. I don't know, but then you have. As soon as I landed on the island, I, I don't have access to Thread. So I'm living, living vicariously through you. What's the word, what's the word out there? <laughs> yeah, it's not very exciting. It's like, it's like a, 
it's, it's a very sort of skinny down, more basic version of Twitter right now, which seems to be missing a ton of features. But I'm always game to kind of have a crack and have a bit of a play with it. And it's nice to be there on day one as one of the FinTwit guys. Um, and so I'm getting in, you know, all the conversations with all of the far wiser, uh, far more highly followed Twitter, well-known Twitter analysts who've made the move. So yeah, you can find me on both Twitter and threads now with the same account at 7 Luke Hallard. The question I have from an investing standpoint, Luke, about this is this increasing worry I'm noticing about, how do I phrase this? tech platforms or investments that are predominantly, if you think about what they are, they're code. So mm -hmm. for example, CrowdStrike, it's interesting in our mind, in my mind, I'll speak for myself. When I think CrowdStrike, I think of an eagle <laughs> soaring in the sky. <laughs> in other words, their marketing cap Hayden is doing a hell of a job, right? But I kind of think like locks and vaults and security and people in the armed guard with, uh, you know, guns and eagles protecting my, my computer or enterprise in reality, it's code. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I guess in the era of AI, the rate at which the code will write itself and better itself is only going to increase its rate. Any, I guess the question I'm trying to wiggle my way toward is any company that is predominantly code like Twitter, to what extent can we feel secure in in, in them as an investment. So I don't know if this is a, if this is analogous to other, other cases, but Elon bought Twitter for what, 44 billion. Now you have yeah. meta, what more or less stealing. I mean, I don't know. I guess that's the lawsuit that's come out of this, right? You can't just steal, but can you, I don't know. And then what happens the next stage is the moment you start talking about, for example, you're now in two places. From a user perspective, I'm thinking, damn it, uh, I love me, I love me some Luke, but I can't, I can't be doing the black mirror thing where I'm following <laughs> Luke, Luke in one place and then his evil twin is a, is on another. And you know, you get that regress of, and at some point there's, there's a, what's called the critical, critical mass. It's hard to achieve. Yeah. How do you see this playing out in, where are we a year from, from today? It's, it's like it's nothing new, uh, Zuckerberg cloning other companies' technology, right? Did the same with Snapchat, did the same with TikTok. Um, you know, they're the masters of, uh, kind of copycatting capabilities and just building it themselves. Um, kind so of like Apple, had, interestingly, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and it's a smart business play, right? Let somebody else build the market, um, prove that, uh, it, there's value to be had, there's revenues to be made, profit to be made, and then go dive in with your significant uh, R&D spend and then just go copy the hell out of them. But this isn't unique to software, right? This has happened in industry uh, from since time immemorial, you know, like, uh, you know, who, who was it? Was it Amazon? Like shamelessly copying all birds, uh, like sneakers, running shoes. And, and this has happened over and over again. So, uh, you know, there's only... There's only so many ideas in the world. Everyone else kind of doing the same thing. Um, so I don't think it's anything special. Uh, but you're right. It's easier with software. It's certainly easier to replicate something and your capital costs. You have to build the thing, but your capital costs are incredibly low compared to most other industries. Well, you know what this actually reminds me of way back in the day was it, uh, Google. There's something called Google plus Google tried to replicate mm. Facebook mm. and they failed. And I don't understand in, enough or maybe understand or don't remember enough of what the stumbling block was, but I imagine it has something to do at the core, uh, with network effects. And I guess that's why I'm asking for your prediction in this case is thread is Meta's version of Twitter going to succeed or not? What's your, what's your intuitive gut say? I kind of hope it turns into something different because it'd be pointless just having like Twitter and Twitter too, with everybody posting the same content on both. Um, so I'm hoping come some kind of culture emerges from this thing and it becomes some interesting thing that's a bit different. Um, and personally, I like the idea because 
I don't want to be, you know, some old man like shouting at all the other social networks, but let's just be honest, right? Twitter is the only place where a good, credible, good quality conversation takes place and people are sharing like valuable due diligence, maybe Reddit as well. Um, but you just don't find that stuff on Instagram, on TikTok. So I'm certainly in my, in my minor sort of playings around. So I think it's healthy for investors. If we're just talking about FinTwit specifically, it's healthy for us all to have another platform where we can start to share long form written content and have these conversations. So I do hope it turns into that. And it's a good thing as well, because I've got a bunch of friends who are on Instagram and, you know, men, like many folk, I've been kind of cross posting to LinkedIn and Facebook and some other things. My big long Twitter posts, they were like, well, I don't have a Twitter account. So they, they're kind of excluded from that content. I'd like to have the conversation with them as well, but I don't want to have to kind of create a whole Instagram account just for that. So kind of threads bridges that world quite nicely, potentially opens up the conversation to many more folk who wouldn't be there otherwise. So that's, I think that's a good thing. What's going to happen in five years? I don't know. I mean, I, I can't year, see any reason why it would. One year. I mean, I can't see a reason why it would fade into obscurity. Like it's, it's super basic at the moment. I think they've rushed to launch it because, uh, Musk uh, puts like, uh, access limits on Twitter. So that just seemed like a great time to jump on that news story and launch threads early. Um, but there's some basic features that are not there, but I'm sure they're going to fix that very, very quickly. Okay. All right. Well, where can folks find you? Uh, at seven Luke Hallard on both Twitter and, uh, threads. Okay. And what's your follower account right now? Oh, 30, I think something like that. 30. Okay. Well, yeah. the moment okay. I get, uh, out of, uh, wh whatever, uh, firewall I'm in, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll join you and, uh, I'll start from zero and see it. <laughs> so you look, uh, rather wild and shaggy. As though you've just, uh, as though you could use a good, uh, touch up on the, on the. <laughs> hey, who couldn't, who couldn't use a good touch up? <laughs> Are you, uh, running off to, to get the hairs, uh, done cut or do we have time for the two truths and a lie game? Well, you got, got time for two truths and a lie. It's your turn to play. You get, you down. I'm going to be asking you. I got three facts, one of which is a lie related to Italy. Uh, you ready Probably. for that? You just, and you read the book as well. Crikey, you've read the book. You're, you're going to nail this. And let's just reflect on the scores. You're currently one nil, winning one nil. So let's see right. if I can have an opportunity to close the score. So three well, facts. Well, clarity, for clarification, Luke, uh, I read the, the history of Sicily, not Italy. So got, you know, <laughs> okay. okay. Right. Right. I, I got a Sicilian question in here. One of the three. Uh, okay. number one. The roots of modern banking are traceable to medieval and early Renaissance Italy, and in particular, the rich Italian cities of Florence, Venice, and Genoa. Mm -hmm. Fact number two. Despite being only the ninth biggest country in the world by GDP, Italy holds the third largest gold reserve after the US and Germany. Hmm. And fact, num fact number three, which you, you almost sort of stumbled into while we were chatting, the, uh, the Cosa Nostra, together with two other Italian organized crime syndicates, is effectively one of the biggest companies in Italy, making up a huge holding company with a total estimated sales turnover of 13 billion euros and profits of 7 billion euros after investments and expenses. Okay, I think I know the lie. Oh, wow. Hmm. Christ. Come on, man. <laughs> Uh, I think the lie is number two, and the reason I'm sniffing it out is because it didn't include China. Okay, so you think gold? You think gold reserves, China, or maybe some other countries have bigger gold reserves than Italy? Okay, Correct. Let's see. Right. Well, so first one probably easy. First one was true. The roots of modern banking were certainly mostly in Venice, Florence, and Genoa as well. Very, uh, very interesting bit of history there. Uh, fact number two is also a truth uh Yo! italy has this monstrous monstrous gold reserves 2451 tons of gold and it's the, like a significant part of the well my my civilian wife is uh just uh has a shocked expression on her face <laughs> as she's listening to us to old banter 
<laughs> is she adorned in gold? Is she, is she like yes. juggling bricks? <laughs> right. <laughs> she, she is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, my Cosa Nostra fact was a lie, but actually for an interesting reason. Uh, if you were to consider the Cosa Nostra as a, a company, they are by far the largest company in Italy um, with an oh. estimated turnover of 130 billion euros uh, and okay. profits of 70 billion euros a year. So I see what you did there. I see what you did yeah. there. Okay, that's interesting that the, the one fact I should have known about because I just read the book <laughs> is, is the one I got completely wrong. See, just goes to show you folks... Uh, being illiterate is the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it just shows anyway, uh, there's, there's big bucks in financial crime. So, uh, you know, you go make some business relationships before you get back to the U S right. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Luke, I hope you have a, an excellent time at Wimbledon, eat strawberries and cream. I'm going to do my job, my part here, uh, to eat the cannolis and, uh, granita and, uh, until we meet again. Beautiful. Don't, don't forget to meditate uh, and don't stress out about your portfolios in these heady times. All right, folks, take care of yourselves. Arrivederci. Fantastic. Beautiful. Arrivederci, Christoph. <laughs>